Thank you, Elder Simon. Last time he did, I said he doesn't look elder, but then I looked at him today. He's looking elderly. So <laughs> you are finally fitting the part, Simon. <laughs> You'll get me after church for that. Hey, if we've not met, my name's Kevin. I'm also an elder, and uh, definitely elderly, uh, and uh, lead pastor. So glad uh, to be here with you. And, uh, you know, Simon was talking about uh, VBS. We've, of course, we've been doing summer camp since the week after school let out. So a lot of you have already been serving uh, through a summer camp, uh, and uh, this week we'll do it for five days. Uh, and, and it just, it reminds me, and I want to remind you um, just how critical these kinds of things are for who we are as a church. We've been doing these kinds of outreaches in our community now for several years, 12, 15 years. Uh, and, you know, when we're serving these kids, I think at times when you're doing the job, it might feel like you're just the person that walks the kid to the bathroom or you're the person cleaning up after the messes. You're the person running the class here uh, in the auditorium. Uh, and it certainly is that, but it's so much more because these are connections uh, and that we see uh, that there is a benefit to a sustained presence in the lives of, of, of these families, both with the kids uh, and their moms and dads or guardians, grandmas and grandpas, whomever they happen to be living with, uh, both here at the church and in our community. And, and I don't ever want us to underestimate the power of that and the accumulative effect. Uh, yesterday, Nona and I are doing some spring cleaning uh, because it's July and uh, we're a little late. <laughs> She had uh, an area rug that uh, she was selling, giving away, and uh, we had someone reach out to us that was uh, one of our camp kids that she's been to camp just about every year uh, since we started doing them. We, we met her when she was five. She's 21 uh, now, and uh, Nona got to spend some time just talking to her in the driveway, catching up on life, and she kind of walked Nona down memory lane of all the camps and all the people and all the connections and uh, we, were have, we were and still are today very involved with the family uh, that she's connected with. And it was just a good reminder for me last night as Nona was updating me on that, just about how important these small things are. And, and it's a big deal for those that plan it. You can ask Michelle and Jamie and Susan, those that plan these things. There's a lot that goes into it. But the things that you're doing, the things you're offering, and if you don't have anything going on this week during the day, it's still not too late you have a chance to still be blessed uh, and to be part of it. Uh, and I just want to say more than anything, thank you. Uh, continue the work. These are critical things that we're doing as we serve the families uh, here in our community and continue uh, to do that. Now, we're going to continue on with our summer series. We're calling it uh, the Summer Book Club. And each week we're taking one book out of the 66 books of the Bible and we're asking the speaker, so far we've had, uh, I'm the third speaker, we've had two others. Uh, Drew uh, preached on First John, Rob preached on, uh, what'd you preach on, Rob? Second Peter, no, yeah, Second Peter, that's right, that was the week you broke my mic, thank you for doing that. <laughs> Just uh, I've taught on Joshua, last week I taught on Hosea, today I'm going to talk on the, on the book of Nehemiah, and what we're doing is we're taking a book of the Bible, and it's, it's impossible to cover any book, even the small ones like Jude. In, in just one message, but we're trying to give you an overreaching, overarching look at what the book is in the, in the Bible, uh, and then finding some specific uh, applications. One or two big things that we can pull out of that, which is, that's the hardest thing to do, because, I mean, today's another great example of that. Nehemiah could preach for weeks. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach it here in 40 minutes, and so uh, I hope that it's been helpful for you. We're going to continue on. We've still got a few weeks left uh, in this series, and, and it's, it's, it's about the books of the Bible, uh, but it's also, in many ways, uh, for us modeling for you our approach to the Scriptures uh, in that uh, we never want to take our theology from a verse. We always want to look at the whole counsel of Scripture, what the overall passage, what the overall book is. We call that inductively studying the Bible. It's what we're learning on Sunday morning in our Bible study and breakfast and all of our Village Academy initiatives. Uh, but this is one way of doing that. So before we jump into any of the books, each of the speakers, me included, we start off with what we call the five W's. These five W's are always helpful, not just in any book, but any passage. And the five W's are who, what, when, why, and where. This is the starting point for every passage we read in Scripture because if we're not careful, we can get going down the road. Sometimes we'll end up with a verse that we interpret 
almost the opposite of, of what it was originally intended if we don't do this hard work. And so we want to model that for you. We want you to feel comfortable. We want you in the Word with us, not just on Sunday morning, but on all the time. And so this series is partly about that also. So let's do that. The who of Nehemiah. Well, of course, it's about Nehemiah, so that answers part of the who, but Nehemiah didn't write it. There's a, some debate, like there's on everything, on who wrote it. Most of, the, most of the, the, the commentaries that I read on it agreed that whoever wrote the book of Nehemiah also wrote the book of First and Second Chronicles. In terms of the way it was written, the language that was used, there's a lot of similarities there. But the person, when they wrote this Old Testament book, did not say who they were. So that's an unknown thing, but it's about Nehemiah. What it is, when we talk about what, in terms of a book of the Bible, we want to start with what genre is it? Because in the Bible, you have books that are written in different ways. We have what we call poetic books, like Psalms. We have books of wisdom, like Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. We have the books of the law, or sometimes called the Pentateuch, which is the early, the first five books of the Old Testament. We have the Gospels, which are the four books about the life of Jesus. We have things we call epistles or letters. These are the letters that the apostles were writing to people in the New Testament. And Nehemiah is what we would call a historical book. Historical book. We, we talked about this when I gave the message on Joshua a couple weeks ago, uh, and where the historical books really account for the history of the people of Israel. And so books like Nehemiah, like Ezra, like Esther, like Ruth, First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Kings, First and Second Samuel, you'll see these books cover a lot of the history of Israel in a very critical time. And oftentimes, and Nehemiah is one of these examples, that these books aren't just telling the story, but they're actually archiving. They'll go through long lists of people's names and families because this is the way they would pass down their history from one generation to the other. And there's also the prophetic books which will come into play a little bit because in the time that we're talking about today, we're going to get to the when, there was a whole lot of people prophesying about the problems that the Israelites were having at the time. So the who, we don't know, but it's about Nehemiah. The what is its historical book. The why is it's telling the history of Nehemiah rebuilding walls. Rebuilding walls. I'll tell you why here in a second. And the where, this happens in kind of Babylon, but also it's really focused on Jerusalem. So between Babylon and Jerusalem. And then I want to tell you the story of the book of Nehemiah using the when. So we're going to go through a little bit of a time frame here because I think it kind of helps structure what's happening in the book of Nehemiah and will get us to the landing part about what I think, one of the big things I think we can pull from this book this morning, take home with us and at least talk about over lunch. So remember last week, I talked about three key dates that we're always mindful of when we're dating a book or we're seeing where a book is in relationship to these three things. That first date was 70 AD. So that was after Jesus' death and resurrection, the beginning of the church age. It is when Rome destroyed uh, Herod's temple. The second temple in Jerusalem was torn down, 70 AD. So 2,000, better than 2,000 years ago. The other two dates were BC, before Christ, and the first one was 722, and I talked about it last week in the book of Hosea. This is where the kingdoms had divided, the northern and the southern kingdoms, 10 tribes to the north, two to the south. And in 722, the Assyrians came in and wiped out that northern kingdom. They no longer existed. They took them away. So at that point, from 722 on, it was just the southern kingdom, just Judah, that third date is 586 B.C., a couple hundred years later, and that's when the Babylonians came in and overtook Jerusalem, much like Rome did in 70 A.D., tore down the temple, broke down all of Jerusalem, carried off men like Daniel. If you've ever read the book of Daniel, this all happened around that time. And it's the beginning of what we call the exile. And so for a 70-year period, the Israelites as a people, as an identity as a place, cease to exist. All of this is in the context of the book of Nehemiah, because what we're going to learn is that there's a, there was a, it was a man named Zerubbabel who began to head back after 586, 
the Persians had come in and, and taken over Babylon. Babylon was just there for a short time, and now it's the Persians that are in charge of this part of the world. And there was a guy named Cyrus that helped them rebuild or start to rebuild the temple. And so they go, and they, on, the, on the rubble of what was there, they begin to rebuild the temple, and within that stops at some point. And that's when Nehemiah comes in, and he's actually ready to be, continue on with the work of building the walls. Here's what 2 Kings 25.10 says about that exile. The whole Babylonian army, under the commander of the imperial guard, broke down the walls around Jerusalem. Nebuzaradan, sure I didn't do that right, the commander of the guard carried into exile the people who remained in the city along with the rest of the populace and those who had deserted the king of Babylon. And so Israel ceased to exist. They carried off the valuable things. They took them from Jerusalem took them back to Babylon, and they were still in Babylon when the Persians came back, but the Persians were going to allow this remnant to begin to return. And that first remnant under Ezra and under Zerubbabel began to rebuild the temple, but then there's this guy named Nehemiah who wants to do something more. Now I'm going to pause here. You guys ever hear Pastor Darrell say, break, break? I think it's some weird uh, uh, Air Force thing that says, basically, I'm going to change the subject, okay? So break, break. I'm going to pause here for a second because it was something as I was studying this week that was interesting to me, and it brings to mind this, again, this idea of inductive Bible study because in 586 is when when the, the Babylonians overcame Israel, and it wasn't until 516, 70 years later, that they began to rebuild the temple. There was a 70 year gap that they were exiles. There was a guy named Jeremiah who was prophesying, who prophesied to the, to the southern kingdom, and he said to them, you're going to have problems. And many of us know Jeremiah 29 11, right? What does Jeremiah 29 11 said? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So Jeremiah 29, 11 is a verse that many of us have. Some of you might have it a tattoo. You've got it on your wall. I see it posted on Facebook. And I don't like rules. But here's a rule. No one is ever allowed to quote Jeremiah 29, 11 ever again unless they include Jeremiah 29, 10. Because this is one of those perfect examples about how people take a scripture out of context and make it say the opposite of what's intended. Because for those who quote Jeremiah 29, 11 on their own, what they're saying to you, and it's true at some level, of course, God wants to prosper you. God wants to build you up. He does not want to harm you. That's all true. But let's read Jeremiah 29, 10. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed in Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promises to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you after the 70 years, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. So Jeremiah 29, 11 is correct, but in the context of the Lord saying, I'm going to put you in exile for 70 years. I will not listen to you for 70 years. And yes, I do have plans for you. Yes, my favor will fall upon you. But in the context of the suffering, and I think it's so important for us to put those two things in tension because God is a God of prosperity but he also hates rebellion. And if you go back to last week's message that God's blessings will follow repentance. And so we don't have many rules, but there is a new rule on your Facebook means that you can never, ever, ever again quote Jeremiah 29, 11, unless you include the context of 29, 10. And that's all happening is what we're talking about here in the book of Nehemiah. This is what's happened. Israel as a identity, as a nation, has been decimated. They are now fully occupied by someone who is their enemy. So who was Nehemiah? 
So Nehemiah, in this exile, after the temple had started, after this guy Ezra, and by the way, the book of Nehemiah, there was a time in the Hebrew, Ezra and Nehemiah are actually one book, just called the book of Ezra. Uh, and in, actually, in the Septuagint, it's actually called First and Second Ezra. It wasn't until later that we separated Ezra and Nehemiah from each other because it's two different things going on, but very interconnected. You see Ezra showing up, of course, in the book of Nehemiah. So Ezra had come back, but the book of Ezra, as we know it, ends with the temple being partially built, but then everybody looking at it and grieving because it looked nothing like Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple was beautiful. It was impressive. This was what a bunch of remnants could do with very little resources. And it was a good thing. It was a temple. But we end the book of Ezra going, this just isn't that impressive. We know later Herod goes on to build a beautiful temple. This is the one that the Romans tore down in 70 AD. But this temple wasn't impressive, but it was a temple. We know that it was part of God's plan. That's when Nehemiah shows up on the scene. And Nehemiah is a Jew, but he's a cupbearer for the king of Persia. And the cupbearer, it's, it's kind of misleading sometimes because when you think about a cupbearer, what his job, part of his job was he would taste the wine of the king to make sure it wasn't poisoned. So if it's poison, he's going to drop dead, not the king. That's a good thing, right? But it was so much more than that. I mean, think about Nehemiah. He was really the secret service, a topic that's been very familiar to us all this week. It was like the secret service for the king. He was in charge of his security. And that we see from the discussions between Nehemiah and the king, they were actually pretty close. He had a lot of respect for him. He was a bit of an ambassador and certainly a close advisor. So this Jew who'd been carried off to Babylon living and working for the king of Persia was a very, very important person, but he never forgot about where he came from. And in Nehemiah 1, this is what he says. Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So we see Nehemiah, this very important person who comes from Jerusalem. He has a heartache. His heart is broken. And that throughout the book of Nehemiah, there's lots of application, but one thread that we see time and time again through the book of Nehemiah is a message on leadership. And we see here what is so often the genesis of a movement of the Lord is when a leader gets distraught. Somebody is frustrated. Somebody has said, that's all I can stand and I can't stand no more, for all of you Popeye people, right? These are people that have just had enough. And Nehemiah takes this had enough and says, something's got to be done. We can't leave it like this. I've got to do something. And note that his first response was to pray and to fast. Let's continue on from there. Now, we know that the king counted Nehemiah as important because it wasn't an easy assumption that Nehemiah could just pick up and leave his job for a while to go back and help with the rebuilding. And in Nehemiah 2, this is Nehemiah talking, verse 3, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors were buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, there he is again praying, and then, I put that in, answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried, so that I can rebuild it. And so Nehemiah does a dangerous thing. He asked his boss, who is this, who's this Persian king, I'd like a leave of absence. I'd like to leave for a while because I'm so distraught about what's happening and the identity, the very future of my people is in question because we started something under the previous kings, but it ain't finished yet. The walls being down and the gates being burnt means that Jerusalem was very vulnerable. We know that they had enemies in the area. We know that that little bit of a temple that had just gotten started was very much in danger of being torn down again because anybody could just walk right into Jerusalem and lay it barren again. This was not something 
that Nehemiah was okay with. I'm not going to read to you all of Nehemiah. I encourage you to go back, read Ezra and Nehemiah this week. What you're going to see then is do something a leader does all the time. So a leader has this frustration. He has this vision. He begins to pray. He begins to sort out his personal schedule, but he knows he doesn't have what he needs, and so he does something very bold and very dangerous to this occupying king. He says, not only do I want the time off, but I'm going to need some timber. I need some lumber. I need safe passage. I need security. So can you help me with that too? Well, we see that the God does something miraculous. He actually does that through the king and grants Nehemiah all of his wishes so that he leaves the king's service at this time, goes from Babylon to Jerusalem, uses the king's forest for many of his resources to rebuild these gates, and he does it all under the king's protection. These are very unusual things that are happening All of it because one man was frustrated, had a vision. God gave blessing and favor to the plan that was there. But we know that Nehemiah, because he was a great manager, he shows up and he begins to survey the walls. It's as bad as what he had heard, but he's quiet about how he does things because they had enemies in the area. Not everyone's going to be excited about Jerusalem reestablishing itself. Not everyone's going to be excited about these walls being rebuilt because I'm certain that there were enemies that had plans to do something with these torn down walls. But despite that, we see that Nehemiah does something miraculous. I'm going to take you all the way to chapter 6 in Nehemiah. So the wall was completed on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that the work had been done with the help of our God. And so we see that there was some genius managerial things going on as Nehemiah was again having people do certain parts of the wall and dividing it up to make sure the work continued, to make sure that the work was preserved, that it had happened, to manage and bring the resources in. But it was clear because it happened so quickly and so suddenly that this was all about God's favor. God had made this happen. Nehemiah was the man for the moment, but it was God that had provided all the resources. So all of those enemies were not happy and then were actually a little afraid. They were actually questioning themselves, much like the enemies of Israel throughout its history. So what does this mean to you and I today? Because I'll fast forward and I'll tell you, I'll summarize very quickly the book of Nehemiah, is that after the wall gets rebuilt and we start to return even more remnants, that unfortunately Israel continues its sinful ways and that the rebellion that was there continues at some level. And so Nehemiah ends, a lot like Ezra did, some great things are happening, but the work just seems unfinished. Despite that, God had done something very miraculous through Nehemiah. So, So what do you and I have to pull from that? Well, there's 50 things that we can pull from it, but but there's one I really want to drill down on. There's one piece of this story that I think is beyond just interesting as it relates to the book of Nehemiah, but I think it's very applicable to you and I this morning in our walk of faith as we go about doing the things of the Lord, and that is the noticing that throughout all of this process is that Nehemiah faced significant opposition. Nehemiah faced significant resistance. It was not as easy as Nehemiah recognizing that there was a problem, identifying that problem, and then everything fell into peace. It might be what you think happened because it all happened so quickly in 52 days, but I promise you behind the scenes that he had enemies that were not happy with what was happening. Nehemiah Nehemiah 2.19, but when Sambalat the Horonite, or he was a Sumerian, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed. What is this you're doing, they ask? Are you rebelling against the king? And so these kings around him, these leaders around him were mocking him, questioning his loyalty to the king, not knowing or questioning whether or not the king was behind it. And we see they went on to throw insults at him, saying things like, if a fox ran on that wall, it would fall over on its own. We, we see that Nehemiah had to adjust his plan and strategy to where not only had they, were they focusing on rebuilding of the wall, he had to actually assign security details to make sure that the enemies 
were not coming in after him. There were times when these enemies plotted to kill Nehemiah, and he had to be warned by the Lord to not fall into that trap. And there was a point to where Nehemiah's workers, they were building with one hand and they had a sword in the other. I want you to think about that imagery. Building with one hand and had a sword. Do you think that had an impact on their productivity? Absolutely. All of this because of the opposition. So 52 days might have been 15 days. We don't know. 52 days is impressive. It's really impressive when you think about the amount of resistance and opposition that Nehemiah had. And I think it's something for you and I to think about this morning. Because we see in Nehemiah that he was a builder. More specifically, Nehemiah was a rebuilder. He was in the business of rebuilding something. And because he was rebuilding something that others wanted torn down, that's why the opposition came. So I'm wondering this morning if some of us can connect with that. Is there something that you've noticed that just frustrates you? Is there something in your personal life, in the life of the kingdom, in this culture, that you look at and say, this is not good? Is there something in your life that needs rebuilt? Is your marriage in need of rebuilding? Are you in an estranged relationship from a child or a close family member? Do your finances need rebuilding? Is there ministry that God has awakened you to that needs activity? Is there a change of vocation because of where you're at right now? All of these things are building projects. All of those things are oftentimes rebuilding projects, tasting something that is a heap of rubble and building something new with it. And so I think there are lots of applications, but I'm certain one that we can all relate to is that whenever we seek to build or rebuild something, there is resistance, that there is opposition. Things are not always going to be smooth sailing. One of the things I, analogy I use a lot, so in my leadership here at the church or Joshua's place or in any of the businesses I've been connected with, and I started this saying, raising my teenage children, is I'll ask the question, is that a speed bump or a stop sign? And usually the context of that is we're in a meeting, somebody brings up, we're working on something, and that person says, well, this is the problem. And so then I ask the question, is that a speed bump or is that a stop sign? What do I mean? And what I mean by that, is this a problem we just need to work through, or is this a problem that's going to halt progress? I think oftentimes, and I found this to be very specific to personality types, some people see every speed bump as a stop sign. So if you happen to be following them through the neighborhood that has a speed bump, they come to that speed bump and they just stop and sit. Some people see the stop sign and they rightfully stop at it, but they never go again. They just stop and sit. I think the first order of business when we think about resistance and we think about opposition is to firstly discern, is this a speed bump? Or is it a stop sign? Because as I look at things, and this t- tells you about my personality, I see everything as a speed bump. Everything is just something we got to roll over. And frankly, the faster we go over, the quicker we get past it. And we might grab a little air on the process going on it, okay? But this speed bump and stop sign analogy, I think, has a lot of application to all kinds of things in our life when we start talking about opposition. Because as we face opposition, I think there's questioning that we need to start with. Before we jump right in, like Nehemiah, we ought to take that frustration and we ought to pray and we ought to fast and we ought to consider. My guess is that Nehemiah went even beyond farther than that as he began to think about what was going to happen. And then as that opposition came, he had to stop and pray and consider each and every time there was a resistance that came after him. And so today, what I want to send you out with is I want us to take a look it's some of those areas of opposition and resistance. And what are the reasons for those resistance? Because I think if we can get underneath of the reasons we're seeing resistance in our life, then we might be better about the decision about whether it's a speed bump or a stop sign or what, in fact, I need to do with it. So in the back of your bulletin, you can fill these in. This will help you at lunch when you want to talk about it and break down the quality of this message with your family afterwards. Who laughed? It was Nona. I can see that. What are those? I'm going to give you five things. Reasons for resistance. The first reason for resistance is resources are needed. Resources are needed. This is a real problem. 
right? Nehemiah started off with an issue that he did not have the means to solve. There were resources that had to come. And so as part of the plan, as part of the prayer, as part of the strategy and management of getting through this thing, he had to see that as opposition. That was a resistance that he couldn't ignore. He wasn't going to get very far without rocks to rebuild it or to trees to rebuild the, the, the gates. Here's one of the things that I think about when I think about resources. This is one of the few areas, this issue of resources, that God says to you and I, the only area, test me. If you've got a resource problem this morning, and I'm specifically talking about financial resources, God has given you permission to test him. And as a matter of practice, you know, and and again, I, I tend to see the world differently sometimes, but I think there are those that have more of a scarcity mindset that when they think about resource, they say there's only a certain amount of resources available And based on this very small pie that I have to chop up in very small pieces, I can accomplish this small thing with this very small pie that I'm going to go on and do hopefully great things. Well, I think we got to think about resources differently. I think first thing we got to think about resources is not ours. Is that oftentimes God entrusts resources to people that are really good at making those resources grow and even better at giving those resources away. I think generosity is the key to us starting and and, and understanding the reluctance and the resistance behind a lack of resources. One of the things that I do as a matter of personal practice, and we just did it here as a church because I think the spiritual thing works either way, is that when we're coming up on on an opportunity as a family, and I know that it's going to have financial resources that are attached to that, I lean heavily into generosity. And I lean heavily into generosity because it's when I'm looking at not having enough that I have the tendency to start to close my hand around resources, and I believe that doesn't honor God. Because when I close my hand around it, I begin to assume that these resources are mine. And instead of closing my hand around it, I want to be about the giving away. I want to put those resources into the kingdom work. I want to take some risks at being generous in some way as I pray and fast and try to understand what God wants to do. We just did this as a church a couple of weeks ago. There's going to be details coming out in the next month or so. I'm going to be sharing with you some things we're looking at, investments that we're going to be making in this facility for the future of this church long term that are going to require more resources than we currently have. And so, knowing that we've got this resource problem coming, what we did as an eldership was we'd agree we need to get generous. There was a church about our size that was in financial need because of a transition they were making, and we gave them $5,000 to help them with their transition. Why did we do that? Because we know that that $5,000 can go to the eventual need that we have, but in the kingdom, God's going to do something very big with what is a smaller amount of the problem that they have, but we have to be in the trust business. We've got to be in the position where we're willing to do what God says we can do on these issues of of resources is testing him. God, I'm going to put into the kingdom something that's already yours, knowing that I can use it later for my thing, but you're God. This is your thing. And, And I want to be really careful here because I know that, you know, 50 years of the prosperity gospel has got us all thinking differently about money to where what you might be hearing is if you give 100, God's going to give you a Cadillac. That's not at all what I'm talking about. I'm talking about trusting God with some of our most precious resources. One of the two most precious resources any of us have are time and our money. Those are the last two things usually to get sanctified. Those are the ones we hold out. We'll sanctify everything else and we'll hold out that money for the last thing. What I'm telling you is that as it relates to God completing in you a work that you do not have the resources for, oftentimes he's going to allow you to take a risk. And oftentimes that risk is going to come in form of money. And God will, and you can pray about it, Lord, who am I, who am I to give this to? What risk am I supposed to take with this? Because that's between you and God. I'm not assuming that that has to come to this church. So resources are needed. But I want you to remember if it's his will, it's his bill. We've got to trust God knowing that if he's behind this, then it's going to be ultimately his responsibility to provide the resources to do the work you're doing. So that's the first reason for resistance. The second reason for resistance is that character needs developed. Character needs developed. 
And what I mean by this is that God will want to do a work in you, whether it's your relationships or whether it's your ministry or your job or your finances, but you may not have the character yet to handle it. And God is loving enough before he gives you the key to that Mustang to give you a few driver's tests first, right? So he will take you through some difficult things. That's what the Apostle Paul talks about in Romans 5. Not only so, but we glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Listen to this. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. If you're waiting on that thing that God wants to, has promised you that you want to move, look at your life and say, is there character? Is there perseverance? Do I have the hope that's rooted in the character of God? Or am I in a difficult time and I'm just mad? <laughs> and I just assume that God's mad at me. But it might be that he's using that very point of resistance to build something new in you. Something stronger, not in your own flesh, but something stronger that relies on him. Character is a big deal when you're rebuilding things. The third reason for resistance, after resources and character, is that God is testing you. God is testing you. Did you know God tests you? He tested Abraham. The writer of Hebrews talked about that. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. Who had embraced the promises was about the sacrifice, his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your, ice, your offspring will be reckoned. So not only was God testing Abraham, he was testing him with the very thing that was going to complete the promise that he had already given him. We know that Abraham was willing to go forward with it. God stopped and provided another sacrifice. But there was a test there. And I believe what we've got to think about is that God's test isn't just for him, but oftentimes God's test is for you. You need to know that you're willing to put faith in God. You need to develop that track record of faith with him, but God will test you. And if it's not God testing you, it might be this. It might be that the enemy is tempting you. God will not tempt you with sin, but I promise you Satan will. And why does he want you tempted with sin? Because he wants you to quit. His goal, like the enemies of Nehemiah, is to begin to keep you in a weakened spiritual condition because you in a trusting, faithful, obedient spiritual position is one that he can't come against. And so he wants to divert that into sin. He wants to distract you with smaller idols that are much less important than this really important thing that God wants to do with you. But the temptation of sin might be too great, and so we've got to be on guard because the devil is in the business of killing, destroying, and destroying things. So resources are needed, character needs developed, God is testing, the enemy is testing you. The final thing is kind of obvious. Sometimes change is needed. <laughs> Sometimes we're seeing that opposition because we need to go a different direction. You know, it was important that Nehemiah, when he heard word that his enemies were coming against him, that he started to put out security detachments. That was a change. So it might be that you're sitting at that stop sign, and rather than sit there and wait through analysis through paralysis, or paralysis through analysis, that you're supposed to go, but you're supposed to go left instead of right. It might be that God is providing you resistance in that relationship you're trying to rebuild, but he wants you to do it differently than what you think. That change is needed in you, change is needed in the situation, change might even be needed in the resources. Now here's the problem. How do I know? <laughs> That's the hard part, right? My, my guess is, as I've listed out these five things, and trust me, there are a lot more than just the five. These are the five that I can personally show, tell you stories about. But how do you know? When I come against this opposition and I come against the resistance, how do I get there? Well, I think there's really three things that I do that have proven to be pretty helpful. The first thing is we need to pray. We, we've got to pray. In that point of prayer, there's a couple of things. One is it recognizes that everything we do and everything that's provided starts and ends with God's provision, God's will, God's direction. And nothing like prayer puts our heart and our mind in that position and frankly puts God in the position to where he began to answer that prayer and began to speak to us through our prayer time with him, through the movement of the Holy Spirit to say, this is what I want you to see. This is what I want you to learn. This is what I want you to go as a result of this opposition. The second thing is, is I lean heavily on my community. Oftentimes, as I'm up against resistance, my emotions 
my experience, my anger, (laughs) might not allow me to be able to fully and objectively assess what's going on. But Nona can, much better than I can, because she might be one person removed. She knows me, and she knows my propensity to do certain things when people come at me in certain ways, and she might be that voice of reason. Other people that love us might say, you're the problem. (laughs) Something in you needs to change. That's the most loving thing a brother and sister in Christ can tell us is something honest about us that needs repented of and needs change, but we've got to trust our community to help us and to not see that as their opposition, but to help us to get over the opposition. And beyond prayer and community, I think we've got to rely on our past experience. That that as I stand here this morning, you know, 20 something years of following the Lord and you know, nearly 20 years of ministry, there's opposition and I resistance that I run into on a regular basis that looks very familiar. And it used to freak me out, and now I go, no, I see what that is. I understand where that's coming from. I understand why I reacted that way. I get that we're not there in terms of resources yet, but here, let's keep moving and let's fill in the blank as we get there. But your past experience, especially, and even your bad experiences are helpful here. Because not all of my past experiences that inform how I deal with the opposition are me doing it the right way. (laughs) Unfortunately, many of those are me doing it the wrong way and saying, I don't do that again, that didn't work. But either way, an honest, objective, mindful view of what God has walked us through. But our past experiences, let me throw this out, are only helpful if we're doing something. (laughs) If your past experience is that you've thought about rebuilding, you've thought about building, you've considered, you've measured, but then you've never acted on that, you probably don't have a lot of past experience to help you. My encouragement to you is to move, take action, talk is cheap, love is a verb, go out there and make some mistakes, do it humbly and allow that the Lord is going to teach you in that moment. Well, this morning as I was preparing, um, I was thinking about Jeremiah and it reminded me that um, it was a prophet Haggai that also um, prophesied around this difficult time in Israel's history, and specifically to the northern kingdom. Uh, when they were rebuilding the temple, the, the temple had begun to get rebuilt, and then it stopped. And the people of Israel had stopped rebuilding, but then diverted all their energy, attention, and resources to building their own houses. And Haggai comes along, and on behalf of the Lord says, you're concerned about your prosperity and your security, but my temple stays in rubble. But when I recalled that, I recalled that that passage was a very important part of the history of this church. That 20 years ago, 2005, the Lord began to speak to Nona and I about coming to South Lebanon and doing ministry. And I'll tell you that in 2005, here was the thought I had this morning. If I would have seen the picture of what the Lord has done now, you know, almost 20 years later, both here and in Celebrate Recovery in Joshua's place, I would have been blown away. I, I, I would have been blown. Today, I'm still not satisfied. Today, I want to see the Lord do even more. But, but at that time, we were just imagining what it meant. We had no idea. There was no picture. There was no vision. We just knew there was, this un, there was this undeniable resistance and frustration that God wanted to do something. And so there were times when we would step out and we would talk to church planners and we would talk to people. And there was a time where after a couple years of trying and nothing really catching, we just stopped. And it was at that time when the Lord spoke to me on September 15th of 2007, and he took me to the, bag of hot, ba- the book of Haggai, and he says, Kevin, this is you right now. You've stopped. I- I've thrown a speed bump in front of you, but you're sitting at the stop sign and waiting. And it was at that time that I went to Nona, and we fasted, and I prayed, and we began to ask the Lord, and at that time, things began to move. And as I sit here this morning, I would love to tell you that everything went smoothly. Everything got harder from that moment on. And we went through what is probably the five most difficult years of our life after Haggai. Five years of it, of us, of unrelenting opposition, unrelenting resistance. But through all of that, the Lord continued to speak to us and show us that he was up to something and he wanted us to be part of it. And as I look back now at those five years, I would never go through it again, ever. If I could avoid it, I would run. But I can tell you how crucial and essential is in the development of character and perseverance and the eventual hope that we have in what is now the Village Community Church. And as we have built that history with the Lord, we've learned as a church, I'm not just talking about Nona and I, I'm talking about all of us, 
is that God's plans will be realized. He is sovereign. We just have to choose if, he, if we're going to be part of that rebuilding. And so this morning, I want you to be part of that rebuilding. I want you and your lives to look at the things that you need to overcome and the opposition and resistance that you're seeing and saying, what do I need to do with that? It might be time to move forward. It's at least time to pray and to bring my community into it because I believe that for those that God has called to be a builder and a rebuilder of walls, powerful things are going to happen. This uh, uh, also happening this morning, my, my nephew, he's in Tennessee, Cleveland, Tennessee, and his wife just posted there, starting a church uh, uh, where it's called, it's called the, the Healing Church. And they're specifically focused on coming along the lost, the broken, the folks who are still getting an addiction. And they launched this morning at 10 o'clock. So they, they've already launched that church. And I texted Isaac this morning, and I said, Isaac, uh, when you do this kind of work, you'll always have plenty of ministry, and you'll never have enough people. <laughs> you, you'll always have more opportunity than the resources, but God is in it. God, and I mentioned Gideon, he's in the business of not enough. And, and he specifically reminded me, where's my phone at, as we talk about rebuilding walls, something that was a very important thing for Nona and I. Let's see if I can find it here. Isaiah 58, listen to these words. Is this not the fast that I chose to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring, your ho- and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you, see, when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh, then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your groom be as noonday. And the Lord will guide you, listen to this, continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places, make your bones strong, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail, and your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairers of the breach, the restorers of the streets to dwell in. I don't think that young girl stopping at our house last night was about picking up an area rug. I I think it was about a reminder that we're in the business of rebuilding walls here. But we're in the business of taking something ancient and ruined and allowing God to do something beautiful in it. And I believe he wants to do that in our church, and I believe he wants to do that in your lives this morning. And so I'm going to do two things. I'm going to pray for my nephew Isaac's church, and I'm going to pray for us. Heavenly Father, God, we pray this morning for Isaac and Sarah. We pray for this new church. God, we know that the kingdom needs more churches that are focused on being places of refuge and healing. God, I pray that you would grant them your favor, your vision, the resources. I pray that you would give them an unending resource of water that replenishes their soul, that you would be their rear guard, that God, they and their town would be the rebuilder of walls the way that you've used this church to be the rebuilder of walls in our town. So God, bless them this morning. Send them everything they need. Give them strength and favor. God, I pray for our church this morning that you would continue on that you've only just begun to work in this church. And God, we know that you do this for us corporately because you're able to do it in us individually. And so I pray for those here this morning that are in places of torn down walls in their life, marriages, finance, relationships, jobs. God, all of those things that you are in the rebuilding business. And I pray that whatever opposition they're up against this morning, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal it, and in this time of communion and ministry, that you would speak specifically to them at where they're taking next. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.